Good afternoon, everybody. I guess it's still morning, so be afternoon by the time we get done. So I hope you'll stick around. Um, I want to welcome everyone to our third forum devoted to the uh, current proposal to fund an expanded transit system here in our city. My name is Craig Phillip. Uh, I'm in the civil engineering department and lead our uh, research programs in transportation and resilience. Uh, we hope that these forums um, for both uh, members of our community and our broader community uh, will do three things. Uh, of course, first, I hope it will inform you so that you can exercise your most important civic duty, and that's to vote. Second, uh, I hope that these uh, forums have excited you about the growing body of research that is going on here at Vanderbilt in this critical area of mobility. And I think it's relevant to our community, our country, and really the world. Um, to put that latter point in, pers in kind of context, last year I attended a seminar over in the economics department. I think, Malcolm, you invited me to it. Um, and um, I call myself a transportation junkie. It's been my passion uh, since I was a little boy, and I've had the good pleasure to, to, to work in, in various facets of transportation my whole career. And I was flabbergasted to learn about the number of new subway systems that are being built around the world. It measures in the dozens. Now, I know we have struggles here in Nashville uh, that, are, that seem both exciting and alarming, depending on, on, on where you're, wh what your lens is. Uh, but what's going on here is in some ways chump change compared to the rapid migration of the world's population uh, into urban places. Uh, with, of course, positive and negative effects. And, of course, that's the reason that there's so much interest in these topics from our research community here at Vanderbilt. Finally, I hope these amazing panelists, uh, both the ones you heard already if you were here in the first two uh, and will certainly hear today, um, that, that you will come away with an appreciation for how complicated this all is. Uh, we're unfortunately into the era of sound bites. Um, but it is, it is complicated because there are many legitimate and important lenses that we need to use. And those lenses may point you in a different direction about what the best path forward is. It's also complicated because part of what we're trying to do is predict the future, aren't we? Um, the pace of change seems faster and the potential for disruption seems likewise. Uh, but we have, to be, we, have to be, we have to be dealing with that. And in many important areas, I would at least maintain that we don't really know what the impacts of some of the choices are going to be. So it's important to do the best we can to be educated about them. Um, I've been trying to link the panels a little bit together, so let me, let me just grab one example from our second panel that I think speaks to this issue. Um, the question is, if autonomous vehicles become widely adopted at some point, will that make congestion worse because it makes travel in a single occupant vehicle cheaper and thus more attractive? Economics 101 would tell you that. Or will it be accompanied by a behavioral shift that makes carpooling much more attractive and thus that reduces congestion? <clears throat> well, several of my colleagues and I are hoping to begin work soon on a research project with the Tennessee Department of Transportation. Uh, and what they've asked us to do I hope they're going to decide that we should do it, uh, is uh, to help them discern what their role ought to be uh, and how they can play a most positive role. Anyway, I bring that up because it's uh, been reading about some of this, and one of them was a, was a uh, document which I came across just this past week called Driving Toward Driverless, a guide for government agencies. So it's certainly something that we'll be using if we are able to do this work. And they suggest that government agencies need to consider at least two scenarios and the range of things in between. One they call the driverless nightmare, and one they call driverless utopia. <laughs> and what we need to make sure of is that we're not making considered choices based on a naive belief that it's going to be one or the other. It certainly won't. Uh, but it is hard to know what way we're going to go. And thus, the, the reason for having so many panels and discussions um, so that you won't be driven by a simplistic view of uh, that you think you know exactly what the future is going to be. So, we have four terrific panelists today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and briefly introduce all four of them now and then just let them come up and not, not be interrupting. Now, you have their full bios uh, in front of you if you picked up one of the sheets. 
Uh, first up this morning will be Malcolm Getz. He's a professor who joined the faculty here in economics in 1973. Like me, he was educated north of the Mason-Dixon line, but has obviously found Nashville and Vanderbilt to his liking. So glad for that. I didn't recall this about Malcolm's time here until I was reading the, uh, the information that was provided to you, but he served as associate provost for Inter information services and technology for a decade starting in 1984. Now, there were, that was another period of amazing transportation, transformation in the computing world, uh, from punch cards to mainframes to personal computers. And I'll bet in your time you had all three of them going on in the, in the campus. Um, I say that because he hasn't been afraid of diving into really complicated issues about the future. Um, as you know, he's been an active participant in the transit debate here in Nashville at least since the bus rapid transit project that we all call the AMP, uh, I guess seven or eight years ago now. So welcome, Malcolm. Um, professor James Fraser will follow Professor Getz. He's a professor of human and organizational development at Peabody. Jim's work focuses on urban studies at the human scale and especially as it relates to housing. Like Professor Getz, he has been very actively engaged in our community's conversations and policy discussions around affordable housing. And he served on the mayor's task force that was looking at the intersection of the transit plan and affordability issues. Eric Kopstein will be our third speaker. He's vice chancellor for administration here at Vanderbilt. I believe it's, it's uh, close to true to say that Eric is responsible for everything non-academic that goes on in the Vanderbilt community. Don't laugh. That's the stuff we all really care about. It's everything people complain about. Yeah. <laughs> like the buildings and all the acreage in between. And I think he's going to talk quite a bit about that. Uh, and uh, I'm told the thing that he hears most about from students, other than the housing, is food, which is also part of his responsibilities. I had the good fortune to connect with Eric um, quite accidentally shortly after I arrived on campus in early 2015. And he had not arrived much before that. Uh, and we have been bound and determined to prove that the academic and administrative sides of our community can offer a lot to each other. And I think we're making good on that. Finally, Jennifer Carlott will be batting cleanup. Her academic lens is political science and public policy. And most of her time in Nashville has been with Metro's planning department, which, where she was assistant director. But she speaks to us this morning wearing two hats. First, as a board member of the Civic Design Center, which has been focused on making Nashville a more livable and attractive city since 1999, and also as the current Vice President for Metropolitan Policy at the Chamber of Commerce, which advocates for our business community. Now, I've been always looking for, uh, for ways to tie our speakers together with Vanderbilt if it's not obvious. Uh, and in Jennifer's case, she shared something with me so I can do so. Uh, turns out she moved to Nashville uh, to follow a boyfriend who was studying here at Vanderbilt. Well, the boyfriend apparently didn't last, but Nashville stuck. So we're <laughs> glad for that, Jennifer. Malcolm, I'll turn it over to you first. Thanks for coming this morning. Look forward to talking with you. I'm the resident critic of the transit plan. And um, I want to raise with you seven problems that I see with the proposal that we are considering. I'm going to read them to you, and then I will come back through and try to bring each of them to life as time allows. Transit, the first number one is transit does not reduce congestion. Second, trains will attract few riders. Third, ridership is falling both locally and nationally. Fourth, so those are sort of negatives. The fourth is that the car services are thriving. Driverless cars are arriving this year. Express lanes increase traffic flow. We're seeing them in more cities. And the sales tax has an extra burden. So to think about transit as addressing traffic congestion, uh, the short answer is that transit does not reduce traffic congestion. And those of you who were here for the first forum 
heard Aaron Haffenshield from the mayor's office uh, carefully explain that transit does not reduce traffic congestion. So this is a, a conclusion which is uh, widely held among people who think carefully about transportation. So I want to introduce to you the iron law of traffic to explain why transit does not reduce traffic congestion. And the concept here is that when space opens up on the roadway, people make more trips. We have those of us who are already here travel more often and more people come to Nashville and fill the roadways. So there is careful statistical evidence uh, over 40 decades which demonstrate this from all points of view, various kinds of data. In economics there's often a lot of disagreement, but here the empirical regularities are so strong that we call this conclusion the iron law of traffic. And as an illustration, uh, Denver adopted a sales tax earmarked for transit in 1973. <coughs> and they've built, eight, and it's in four counties, and they have built 86 miles of railroad, they operate 170 bus routes, and they have increased the share of their workforce who travel to work by public transportation to 7% of the population. This is in the core county, the Denver County. <coughs> so after uh, 45 years of their aggressive transit program, we can look at how long journeys to work take. And here in Nashville, it takes on average 24 minutes to get to work, and in Denver it takes 25 minutes to get to work by automobile. And travel by transit, it's 42 minutes by transit here in Nashville, and 43 minutes in Denver. So the message here is that uh, transit can be worth doing, it may attract people to the city, but it will not change the level of congestion in our roadways. An implication of this finding is that transit has little benefit for people who do not use the transit. Among workers in Davidson County, about 2% travel to work by public transportation. 15% of our population are below the poverty line. So it is even a minority, a small share of the poorest of the population of Davidson County who use public transportation. Most of us have other ways of traveling around our city. Our second uh, concern is that tra trains will attract few riders. And to illustrate this point, I'm looking specifically at the Gallatin Road Railroad. And the circle at the upper right is Rivergate, and today we have a bus rapid transit, a limited stopped bus route from Rivergate, which goes all the way downtown to the uh, Music City Center bus depot downtown. The proposal for the train is to swap out the bottom half of that, rail, of that bus line with a train. So people who are traveling from Rivergate and Madison will have to transfer from the bus to the train at the old Walmart just north of Briley Parkway. The rule of thumb in the transit industry is when you build in a, a transfer, you lose about 15% of your riders. The volume of traffic north of Briley Parkway on Gallatin Road is about 39% higher than the volume of traffic in the southern part of Gallatin Road because tra traffic coming southbound on Gallatin, much of it swings over to Ellington Parkway and it takes about 10 minute ride to get into town. So as a consequence of these features here, this train will be primarily serving local customers south who live and uh, journey begins south of Briley Parkway. The cost of this train is $789 million. It, will provide, it moves at about the same speed as the bus rapid transit moves today, and it will have about the same number of stops, probably in about the same locations. Here's what busways will look like. There'll be four busways. And this is uh, one on Dickerson Road, the one for which we have an illustration. And on the upper left, you can see a photograph from Google Maps that shows a five-lane roadway, two lanes in each direction with a, a dedicated, uh, with a left-hand turn lane in the middle. To the lower right is an artist's rendering of what the busway will look like, might look like, on Dickerson Road. And the red lanes, the curb lanes, are for buses only. I assume that there'll be photographs taken of license plates of vehicles which travel into the red lane and people will get a surprising bill in the mail if they violate the rule about bus only. A bus will come about every 10 minutes during rush hour, about every 15 minutes off peak. Busways are proposed for Hillsborough Road, 
So I'd like you to imagine a similar facility going out Broadway and out 21st through Hillsborough Village to Green Hills, and a similar busway out West End. <coughs> uh, crossing 440, going out to Harding Road, well, it will turn right and go White Bridge Road to Charlotte Pike. So we'll be moving bus lanes like this through the intersection at Harding at White Bridge. My third observation is that transit ridership is falling. And I've listed cities which, I've listed Nashville at the top, we're down about 3% over the last several years. Denver is down 5%, Portland 8%. And I've chosen cities that have typically been used to compare what Nashville might achieve uh, if, we, if we move ahead with the dramatic plan which we have uh, contemplated. I've listed Chicago and Philadelphia to illustrate what's going on in old line, heavy rail, dense transit-based cities, and they are losing ridership uh, as well. So across the country, with some exceptions, uh, transit ridership is declining. So when we're considering uh, uh, major investment in transit, we really have to think carefully about why the ridership is declining here and elsewhere. Is this a path that is going to pay off for us? And one reason why it may be declining is because of gentrification. So this is an image on Main Street at uh, 6th Street, uh, Main Street at 6th Street. You can see the uh, Tennessee Capitol at the very end of the street. Uh, and these are condominiums where the prices start at about $300,000. So about 25% of the population of Davidson County have enough income to be able to afford one of these housing units. These have been described over the last decade as transit-oriented development because they're located where there's a pretty good transit service, but it turns out that people at this income level uh, are not too keen about riding the transit. And the middle-income people and lower-income people who have moved away as the housing prices have gone up are moving away from where there's effective transit service. And so that can be one reason why transit ridership is declining. And cities all over the country are experiencing um, gentrification. A second reason is certainly the car services. So I, I assume that many of you are, most of you are familiar with the car service, and these are really based on digital tools that, which do the dispatch, that pre-position where the car is up, are located for quick pickup. They use a direct, direct route to destinations. Uh, they are an effective uh, transportation mechanism. Uh, and the car services are evolving rapidly. There's technical change going on in the car services industry, and one example of that is carpooling. So I've got an image here of a van with uh, multiple passengers in it, and Lyft and uh, Uber introduced their pool service here in Nashville in December. And among the 16 cities in the United States and 20 uh, cities in other countries, about 20% of the riders pool, uh, in Uber are using the pool service. So it is a significant innovation, putting more people in individual automobiles. <coughs> um, in the interest of time, I won't explain the, explain the express pool, but by pooling, a ride which if you hire one person in, uh, with the uh, Uber here at a charge of 1224, that drops to 850 when it is a pooled ride, and it drops to 425 with the express pool, which involves a bit of walking and a little more delay. So these are, specific, these are significant innovations that are reducing the cost of using the car services pretty dramatically. My fifth observation is that self-driving cars are here. This is an image of the uh, Chrysler Pacifica. Waymo is a unit affiliated with Google. They began developing driverless cars, in the technology for it in 2009. They've been testing these driverless vehicles in, Fe in the Phoenix area for more than the last year. They now have a license from the state of Arizona to begin commercial operation of their driverless car-based service in this calendar year. And they've announced they will do it this calendar year. They have a fleet of 600 of these cars in our operation today in test mode. Driverless cars are here. They have ordered 25, uh, 24,000 of these cars for delivery between now and 2022. 
They are testing their uh, driverless facilities in uh, cars in other uh, cities around the country, and so this is going to roll out across the country uh, in the years immediately ahead. Here's a driverless car from General Motors, their Cruise AV, and they are testing it in the streets of San Francisco, and in the fall they gave rides to reporters to illustrate how effective their uh, self-driving car is in the complex driving patterns of San Francisco. General Motors characterizes the cost per mile of a current driver service at, at two dollars and fifty cents and that involves the driver, the fuel, and the car. With the driverless car that will drop to a dollar fifty a mile and then as more people are using the car services that cost will will gradually go down to about a dollar a mile. So if you combine the uh, driverless cars and the dramatic decrease uh, in cost from the driverless cars with the pooling function in the car services, you can get the, a cost of a ride down to well under 50 cents a mile. That's less expensive than owning an automobile. And my students, undergraduates here at Vanderbilt, say that it's more convenient and less expensive to rely on the car services today than to own an automobile on the Vanderbilt campus. My sixth observation is that express lanes increase traffic flow. And the image I have for you here is an express lane in I-85 in Atlanta that opened in 2011. This is a former HOV lane which now has dynamic tolling. And the sign which you see in the middle of the picture announces the current toll for use of the express lane. And the toll is updated every six minutes in light of the current traffic flow. And the toll goes up as the volume of traffic goes up so that traffic continues to flow. In California, an SR-91, which opened in uh, 1995, the toll gets up to a dollar a mile at 3.30 on Friday afternoon. So it, is a, it has real bite in order to keep traffic flowing all the time. My son who lives in Atlanta can put his car in cruise, cruise control at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on I-85 and move at full speed while the lanes nearby are stop and go. Now that's, I've described what an express lane is. Let me uh, make sure that you understand that when you compare the flow of traffic where traffic is moving as a consequence of managing the flow with dynamic tolls with the heavy traffic and stop and go where people are creeping along about twice as many people can complete their trip per hour in the express lanes than complete their trip in heavy stop and go. That is, we are practically doubling the throughput of the roadway when we apply dynamic tolling to keep traffic moving. Okay. Second thing that I want you to understand about express lanes is that it is an effective transit strategy. 26% of the people who are moving on the I-85 express lane are in commuter buses, moving at full speed, just with the other traffic. <coughs> So this is a way in which lower income people can take advantage of the express lanes with their uh, more rapid travel, faster than trains, because trains have to make stops. These are non-stop buses. Uh, and um, you don't have to have a dedicated facility for the transit service. You can have a better quality transit service without spending $150 million a mile to build a railroad. We now have some, here's, Here's a map of uh, Georgia Department of Transportation's plan for express lanes in the Atlanta area. The yellow to the northwest, northeast and the southeast are open and running today, as I've described in the I-85. The purple lines to the northwest and to also to the northeast are under construction now, and these are new lanes being built in the right-of-way of the interstates, but not, not on the same level as the existing lanes. So these are new lanes dedicated for um, express lane purposes. And the green are additional um, locations for express lanes which they expect to complete by 2040 and the dotted lanes would come after that. Express lanes are in use in 11 states across the country uh, including uh, Florida and uh, Texas and Colorado, California. So Craig posed the very important question, what is the implication of the car services for, and uh, driverless cars for traffic congestion? And the answer is when we make 
traffic, when we make trip making easy and inexpensive, we're going to want to make more of it. So it's clearly going to increase traffic congestion. <coughs> but when we are using car services, we are paying poor for the ride. We're paying by individual ride. We're paying by the drip, if, if you like. And the fees for car services already reflect time of day and distance traveled. They have surge pricing. Surge pricing is higher, more expensive at peak. You see it in airlines, you see it in hotels, and you see it in the car services. Well, <clears throat> we need to price out the use of our streets, much as we're doing on the express lanes, price it out in the cars and build it into the technology for operating the car fleet so that the congestion uh, scarcity value of a space on the street is reflected in the price of using the cars. It's going to take us a while to get there, and we're going to have to work hard at teaching ourselves that this will actually work. So we'll start with the express lanes. When we've uh, convinced Craig this is going to be a great idea, uh, then we can move ahead to the really the big jump to uh, retrofitting uh, pricing. Uh, my seventh concern is that the sales tax puts an extra burden on low-income families. So I explained earlier that only a small fraction of low-income families will use public transportation. And this uh, chart shows that as a fraction of income, lower income households are paying a higher share of their income in sales tax. So I think the uh, financing light railway in our middle of our streets with a sales tax is uh, unfair. And uh, the benefits, if the trains actually worked and got more people in and out of downtown, would have the effect of increasing the value of the property downtown, and that's where a significant share of the benefits go. That increases my concern about the unfairness of the sales tax at the base of it. So thank you very much. I'll conclude here. Good afternoon. Um, today I wanted to talk a little bit more about the implications of the current transit plan on affordable housing that affects a great deal of people who currently live in the city and people who are having to move out because of the lack of affordable housing that we have in Nashville. So this first slide is just to kind of show in some of a dramatic uh, form that we are experiencing over 100 people moving to Nashville daily. And many of the population that's moving to Nashville are coming here from cities where the um, quality of life means that they're paying a lot more than they would pay in Nashville just because San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago tend to have more expenses related to housing and transit than Nashville does. But as people are moving in, um, we see that we've had somewhat of a uh, boom in uh, our housing market. And in fact, in 2017, uh, Nashville was cited uh, by Home Builders Association as the top uh, place for hot housing markets in terms of per capita increases. So we know that we're facing currently an affordable housing crisis in the city. And what um, really intrigued me by being on the mayor's task force for transit and housing is that I got an opportunity to take my housing interest to people that were more, had more expertise in transit and think about how we could do these things together. I largely agree with the points that our former speaker made about, um, you know, considerations we have to think about when it comes to, to transit and people actually using it. Because if we look at most census tracts around Nashville, it is ridership around 2%, maybe 3 or 4%. In some lower income tracts, it, it approaches 7%. But 
Uh, I leave that to people that have more expertise on how to attract folks to ridership. What I do want to point out, though, is we know from quite a bit of research from around the country that transit-oriented development, where you have, for example, uh, rail stations, uh, increases property values and land values, and typically without affordable housing measures put in place in advance, prices low-income and moderate-income people out of being able to live uh, near these transit options. And I wanted to just kind of put a little point on this. If we think about renters right now in Nashville being cost burden, meaning that they're paying over 30% of their monthly income to housing, it's about 44% of, of our entire population of renters. But when we look at low income renters paying over 30% of their income, it's 70%. And for a lot of this population, they're paying over 50% of their income. When we think about the sales tax associated with the current transit plan, uh, again, agreeing with the former speaker, we have to be thinking about how is this going to affect those with the least among us. In addition, if we think about how housing and income pairs together, um, between 2011 to 2016, we see an increase in rental prices of 56%, which is huge, right? Uh, but when we look at wage increases for that very same piece of time, they're only 12%. So we do have an increasing pool of people or population that need to have uh, real policies put in place, especially if we're going to be doing major uh, in a, you know, transit uh, building, unless this transit really isn't for them. So when we think about the deficit right now in affordable housing in our city, uh, in 2015 uh, numbers, we have a, a deficit of about 15,000 units. But that's projected um, by a mayor's office report, as well as those of us who do research in the area, to increase by 2025 up to 31,000 units, which drew me to the task force because the subgroup that I was on, led by uh, Councilman Bob Mendez, we were tasked to try to think about how can we put policies in place to assure that if the transit plan in any form gets passed and we as a community decide that we want to do something like this, that it really will benefit everyone, not just people that um, may choose to ride if they're higher income or may not, but really tapping into our lower to moderate income populations. And really what guided this was that we can't like roll the dice on it because we know from studies over 20 to 30 year period of time in cities around the country that without affordable housing policies put in place prior to the development of uh, transit corridors, prior to the building of light rail, prior to even increasing uh, bus service and making that more attractive, that we will lose affordable housing in areas that are now connected to a greater extent whether that's direct loss because people are going to use the transit or it's loss because it's a more attractive area around these stations to, to commercial development um, is an empirical question that would have to be answered. But we do know that we need to put policies in place in order to keep housing affordable, especially if we're going to be doing major transit uh, renovations and, and building. So back in 2014, uh, my graduate students and uh, Doug Perkins, who's a professor in my department, and I wrote a report on equitable development. And we came up with a range of tools to fund, build, uh, preserve, and retain affordable housing. I'm not going to go through this right now, but I'm going to say that the task force actually used this document and used other research uh, from the mayor's office to think about what are the actual policies that we can put in place uh, whether the transit plan is approved or not, but especially if it is, how can we assure that it will be beneficial for low to moderate income families? And the task force came up with these following recommendations, and I'll just put a little bit of detail on them, but you can find the entire report 
uh, on the mayor's website. Um, first, we uh, came to the conclusion that community outreach and education needed to happen. People needed to know whether they were commercial businesses in these areas that were going to be developed with transit, or there were homeowners or renters that change would occur. And to get community members involved, uh, much like the Community Resource Center does, much like the Civic Design Center does, uh, is a positive thing because we want this to be done in a democratic way, similar to Nashville Next, where you have community input, but also so people understand what's happening. Second, we wanted to make sure that there was guidance for transit-oriented development, that the actual corridors that are being proposed for these changes are actually going to have a plan that focuses on where people are going to have their kids go to school, where social services are going to be available, where housing will be available, and to tie all these things in together as opposed to thinking about transit separate from these other domains. And that kind of brought us to greater government alignment. So um, I've only been here 10 years. I hesitate to make comments on the alignment of our different government agencies. But working with MDHA, the Development and Housing Agency, and working with the mayor's office, I can say that at times things work smoothly, but there's always room for improvement to align the different major entities that operate in our city to provide you know, housing, to provide transit, to provide education. So one of the things that we recommended was that if MDHA, our housing agency and development agency, is going to be the one responsible for implementing and for making decisions about what can be built and where as it relates to a possible transit plan, we need to make sure that first, that community outreach piece happens. Second, that we get guidance to make sure that there is affordability built into the plan. And third, that these different organizations work together, that there is clear communication and transparency so there aren't surprises. Next, and maybe one of the more important points that we came to was that we need dedicated funding for affordable housing. That we can't just rely on, well, we'll build the transit up and then we'll be thinking about getting developers in the private sector to build affordable housing or to build moderate income housing because you know, since the 1930s, when the real estate industry fought public housing because they did not want competition uh, with the government for rental properties, um, the sentiment really in the city, is, as much as I have plenty of friends who are developers, I don't know many of them that feel that the right incentives are being put in place yet for them to actually participate in building housing for different segments, income segments of our of our community. So we have to be thinking about what funding can be put in place uh, for the nonprofit sector to build housing and to preserve it, but also for public-private partnerships to really be effective. If we want to make sure that we have housing that's av available to different incomes, obviously our nonprofit sector plays a major role, our government plays a major role with policy, but our private sector by far is the greatest developer of housing and to kind of unleash the potential of those public-private partnerships is one of the things that we felt was very important. I wanted to talk a little bit beyond the task force uh, to say that it's not just government that needs to take responsibility for thinking about where people are going to live. I mean mobility through the city is very important but you have to have some place to actually go at night, to go home in order to rest, in order to be able to sell your labor power the next day to an employer. And so we decided, those among us in the nonprofit and activist communities, to start an initiative to get the public involved called Welcome Home, the Movement for Affordable Housing. And what we've done is built on the research and built on the efforts that the city has already started to put in place. And they fall into four categories. First, as I talked about with the task force, we're, we need dedicated funding for this. 
It can't just be something that is $10 million a year to a Barnes Housing Trust Fund. As much as that is a nice start, uh, that doesn't come close to doing what we need to do in order for our workforce as well as for our lower income families to be able to live in the city somewhere near where they work so we aren't on the highway longer periods of time. Second, it focuses on neighborhood preservation. We know that if a transit plan goes through where these stations are built for light rail and where new opportunities are opened up for real estate development, it's very possible that some of these neighborhoods will start to see gentrification pressures where lower income to moderate income families get priced out. And so we focus on that. And then third, as the task force uh, also recommended, we want real accountability. And that means a scorecard. What has been funded, what has been built, what has been preserved, and what has been retained on a quarterly basis. That's something that anyone would want, any investor would want. That's something that any private sector developer knows before they start their project. What is the pro forma tell them? We want a report card or a, a, a you know, scorecard just to make sure that the investments that we're making in transit and housing are actually producing results and that we're not putting resources in the wrong places. And then last, legal commitment. So this initiative is also focused on trying to pass legislation that I'll talk about in a second to make the funding happen, to actually make preservation a reality, and to make accountability real. So in terms of funding, based upon uh, Mayor's Office of Housing Report and other pieces of research, uh, we've come to the number of about $775 million over the next eight years that it will take to build enough housing to get those 31,000 units done by 2025. Uh, similarly, we see the Barnes Housing Trust Fund, an entity that was begun a few years back that receives, as I said, monies already as an entity that could service bond and mortgage debt. So we're not talking about increasing the sales tax. We're not talking about burdening the citizens of Nashville at the lower incomes uh, even more than they are now. But we're talking about a sustainable way to build housing, to purchase properties and rehab, and to make sure we have a housing stock that reaches, remember, almost half of our renters, no matter what income, are paying over 30% of their monthly income to housing. Second, and this has been discussed in the mayor's office as well as in the task force, we want a community land trust, which is an entity that would be city-led but nonprofit, designed to purchase land and existing housing stock for the purpose of making permanent affordable housing a reality. And that's something that uh, the housing fund right now, which is a a uh, community development finance institution has been tapped to possibly be a community land trust and play that role. And in addition to that, a municipal land bank, which is a different entity, would be uh, an entity that's created to start purchasing properties and holding them until developers, whether they be for-profit or non-profit, are ready to do development and to build housing to serve the broad community we have that are now having to move further out into other counties or to the edges of our county. The scorecard's pretty straightforward, but it would just require Metro to make a transparent and accessible accounting of what we're doing, where our successes are, and where we see deficits. And this is important for the public, so we know that if we vote to fund housing measures, if we vote to fund transit and housing together, that we actually are getting what we've been sold. And if we're not, then looking at how can we change course to make sure we hit our targets. So I uh, would invite you all, and I feel like a salesman right now rather than a research professor at Vanderbilt, to join us at Welcome Home and to uh, get involved and see what uh, Welcome Home has to offer because it's one way that the general public can get involved in this by signing up,
finding out what's going on. Uh, the uh, initiative has a website, a Facebook page. We have over 50 organizations now affiliated. They range from all different political spectrums, from the nonprofit, for profit, as well as individual levels. And uh, we are basically citizens that come from different walks of life, whether we're faculty at Vanderbilt or whether we are directors of nonprofit housing organizations or whether we are private business people. As I uh, met uh, last week at one of our meetings, we've seen all the sectors come together because, as we've been told, government can't do it all. The private sector needs to be incentivized, but is not going to be able to do it all. But with the momentum of us as a public to push the issue forward, we can actually make reality of affordable housing and mobility through our metropolitan area a reality and make it look more like what we believe would be what we want. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure uh, for me to share uh, the podium with such a great group of panelists today. And as soon as I find my slides here, I'll get started. There we go. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to place a little bit of a different lens on this transit discussion by talking about what this means in the context of the Vanderbilt University campus. Um, we have a lot of people from the Vanderbilt community here today and a lot of people from beyond the community, so welcome. It's always great to have people come and visit our campus. And we have had a campus land use initiative underway for the past several years now that we refer to as Future VU. And by way of context, I'll say that university campuses are really very, very special places. Their buildings, their landscapes, their architecture, these things serve to shape the experiences of our undergraduates, our graduate students, our faculty, our staff, and our community, and they shape the memories that students have of those formative years that they spent here at Vanderbilt. I like to think that when members of the Vanderbilt community, particularly alumni, engage and walk on the campus, they reminisce and they recall and embrace the effect that Vanderbilt as a place had on their lives. I think these quotes here, one from our chancellor, this is one of his inimitable off-the-cuff remarks that he made, as well as the quote from Cesar Pelli right below, really help to underscore the importance of land use efforts from a university perspective. And sometimes people have said to me, well, what is a land use plan? What are you, what are you really talking about here? I'd like to say, you know, my, my view is that a land use plan for a campus is a blueprint for the physical development of campus that must be tethered to and in support of the institution's academic research, teaching, and innovation mission. And first and foremost, a land use plan is not really a technical exercise in my view, but rather an exercise in vision and strategy and guiding principles. So why, why is Vanderbilt doing a land use plan now? And ultimately, I'll relate this to the transportation dialogue. And there are really several key reasons. Okay, I think the other panelists pointed out the rapid um, and really intense degree of change that's happening here in Nashville. 100 people moving here a day. The It City, I have a picture of the crane watch in the bottom corner. And Vanderbilt as an institution, as a place, resides right in the middle of this. Between the university and the medical center, we have nearly 30,000 employees, okay? We are the largest non-governmental employer in the entire state and as such are a destination for people not just in Nashville but across the entire region. So we don't want to remain insular to this change. We want to participate in this change and provide leadership and win-win opportunities for both the university and the community. And I think there are a lot of points of connection there around transit and transportation. Um, secondarily, some of you may understand that just over 
Now, almost two years ago now, the university and the medical center were legally separated for a lot of very good reasons that I won't get into now. But that timing kind of enabled the university to place a uniquely institutional and university-centric view on its land and on the campus as a place. And thirdly, and importantly, and unlike some of our peer institutions, we actually have a well-articulated academic strategic plan, again, which, uh, to which we can tether our physical aspirations for our buildings, for our landscapes, et cetera. And sometimes it's interesting how often other institutions sometimes get things inverted and they just start building things, um, but there's not really a strategy behind that. This picture I like to show because it is one intended to demonstrate contrast. In the upper left-hand corner, you see a picture of a beautiful, timeless example of architecture here on the Vanderbilt campus, and to the right, you see one of our beautiful sacred landscapes. I would um, posit that when people are asked to maybe close their eyes and picture a beautiful place on the Vanderbilt campus or picture a beautiful place on any campus that you visited, you see something like a building like this, or you see a landscape like on the right. You don't probably picture what's in the lower left-hand corner, which was an earlier picture of the Ertzen Midtown Plaza, our new 800,000 square foot neighbor, which is right across the street um, from the institution, and frankly, was probably an opportunity for Vanderbilt to better protect its borders through a real estate strategy that we were not exercising well when that land was procured by developers who were focused on ROI. And this is my point of this is my point of clarity here. As stewards of this institution, we have the wherewithal and the utmost responsibility to think not in terms of you know short term term ROI, how do I build something and flip it and make a lot of money? We want to think in terms of centuries. We're not going anywhere. We grow from the soil. We don't say, hmm, this transit, you know, all this traffic, let's, there's some cheap land in western Kentucky. Why don't we move the university? You know, there's some free parking up there. That is not, that is not how it works. Um, we're here and we have to participate um, in the dialogues. So we've had all kinds of opportunities across the campus to engage with the community around the myriad topics that comprise this future VU plan. And here you see some of the values in a word cloud format that have really started to emanate through a lot of input and discourse with our, with our community. I think this is an interesting graphic as well. One of the things the, that we talk about sometimes is the history of development on the Vanderbilt campus. Today, Vanderbilt is a place that's about 335 acres, but it was not always 335 acres. And when you rewind all the way back to 1873, at the founding of the institution, Vanderbilt comprised 75 acres. And it was over decades and a series of land acquisitions, et cetera, that the campus expanded. So the important note here is that Vanderbilt is a place is really a series of neighborhoods and at the pedestrian level those neighborhoods are not all that well connected we have plenty of parking on campus I'll tell you more about that with some future graphics but there has never really been a coherent strategy about how parking transportation and mobility are dressed within the confines of the campus so with this, you see a very high-level overview of a future campus. You see West End kind of running along the top, 21st Avenue, north, south. And you see the concept of a beautiful greenway connecting on a north-south and an east-west basis across the campus. The idea here is Vanderbilt um, enjoys a strategic advantage in part because we have a beautiful compact campus that has a park-like setting. We want to enhance that and we want to preserve that and the concept of a greenway is a way to make the campus more traversable at a pedestrian level, on bicycles, make it more safe, um, etc. And there's much more I could go into in the details of this plan, but that is an underlying principle. How do we make the campus more well connected and weave together at a pedestrian scale this tapestry of wonderful neighborhoods? There are some barriers, though, to accomplishing that vision. This is a map of all of our parking on campus. Okay, and this is kind of a rhetorical question at the top. If you take the 25% of Vanderbilt's land and you place something like current market values on that, we're sitting on an opportunity cost 
of a billion dollars plus in terms of land locked up in parking. So, for instance, if we had a million dollars, a billion dollars, excuse me, burning a hole in our pocket and we said, hey, there's, a, you know, there's 80 acres right across the street, let's buy that and let's Let's build some parking. Um, I, don't think we would, I don't think we would do that. So this is not the highest and best use of our land, but how do you reduce the amount of our precious land? And we are relatively landlocked. You know, universities tend to grow and expand, but we're in the middle of an ur urban region here in Midtown. How do we unlock the potential to use our land for the highest purposes in support directly of our mission and do that responsibly? That is a vexing question that our future VU discussions have led us to engage. I think this is a, this picture really I think speaks to some of the points that the, the, that the earlier panelists really talked about. These, you see a little red section right in the middle. That's the Vanderbilt University campus on a map of the region here. And each one of these dots represents where some member of the Vanderbilt community lives. Okay, and what gets really, really interesting is you start to see where do all the graduate students live? Where do the faculty live? Where do the staff live? And then you can also say, well, where do they live in relationship to our existing public transportation infrastructure? And I think things get even more interesting when you introduce other elements, like income levels. Okay, so to expand on that, this is a very simple regression analysis. And along the bottom, you see income ranges for people at Vanderbilt University. So I think I have it arranged as 0 to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 150, 150 to 200, 200 plus. And there is a very, very tight relationship between how much people earn and how close they live to the center of campus. So not surprisingly, the less you earn, the further away you live. And I'm actually doing some time series of this, where if you look at this as of 2016 versus 2010 versus 2006, there's this forced diaspora that's happening because of the gentrification and some of the pressure pressures um, that the other panelists mention. And of course, the places that people are being forced to move because of the rise of Nashville, the rise of rents, the uh, dearth of affordable housing, et cetera, are places that, even worse, are not currently well served today by public transportation. So I think the points about how you think about a transportation plan in relationship to affordable housing um, is really, really critically important. These little word bubbles here represent some actual quotes from our community. So, you know, people love the green space. They don't like the walk down to Blair. One of my favorite and most glaring examples of opportunity here on the campus, if you just go a little bit down the street here, you're confronted by a 12-story, 4,000-spot parking garage. And whenever we engage external architects and planners and they're getting to know our campus, they gasp. And they say, who did that? Who put a parking structure practically in the geographic center of campus to draw 4,000 vehicles right into the center of campus every single day? That entire area south of there down to the Blair School is often referred to by our students in our community as the Highland Island because it feels so isolated. So in our plans, we could foresee a future where there is not a parking garage there and we could use that for higher and better purposes, more related and in support of our mission. But how do we do that responsibly? I think um, a lot of my colleagues from the sustainability team are here. Interestingly, when we think about the carbon footprint um, of Vanderbilt University, a third of that footprint is actually attributable to vehicular travel for the members of the university community. So if we want to be a sustainable university, which is clearly one of our values, we need to be able to move the dial on this. And ultimately, to me, the meta question is, how do we incentivize and create options that will result in less single occupancy vehicles needing to travel to the Vanderbilt campus? And what the environmental impact of that could have is very significant. Um, we've talked already about some of these factors. And I think in the university context, um, you know, one, one of the areas I get the most feedback on, let's say, is parking. 
So people will always say, there's nowhere to park around here. And what they really mean is I can't park right next to my you know, building and walk right in, or better yet, why don't I just have a drive-in and I can just walk out and my office is right there. We've actually studied utilization of our parking and we don't have a shortage of parking on campus, but where there, are short, where, where there is parking available requires a little bit more um, of a walk. And 10 years ago, if I started saying we're gonna reduce parking, that's really honestly when the pitchforks come out. You say to people, would you like a green, more sustainable campus? And everybody says, me, me, me. And then you say, well, would you be willing to walk a little further? Would you be willing to change your personal habits and the modes of transportation you use to come to campus? And they're like, no, I want the first thing, but the second thing, I just don't want it to impact me. But because of the things on this graphic here, I think today we can have a very different kind of dialogue because of this series of technological, sociological, um, and information technology related inflection points that are going on. Um, Malcolm, you talked about uh, autonomous vehicles are already here. They will have an impact. How do we understand that and extrapolate what that impact will be and be planful for that on the campus? The Internet of Things, the 30 billion devices worldwide, each which have their own kind of embedded intelligence in terms of IT, can actually communicate with one another and form something more like an ambient intelligence that has some real implications. Uh, for transportation. I mean, how do you think those dynamic uh, pricing models work? It's all based on IT. Of course, I often take refuge in these discussions with the conversations with our students, especially students who come from other parts of the world where the concept of automobile ownership is rather foreign to them. So millennials today are, I think, according to some of the, statist the statistics I've looked at, seven times more likely to use public transportation um, really don't have the same ownership uh, with the car kind of relationship that many of us are used to. And then of course there's the promise of smart cities. All of this is underlied by data and analytics and we've talked about the significant impact of rideshare programs and how can we harness rideshare programs as alternatives, for instance, to having students bring vehicles to campus to begin with? How do we exert the scale of Vanderbilt to get reasonable um, and outstanding service through those programs? This is kind of interesting. This is a map of campus. It's a heat map. Uh, we enabled our Commodore cards on which our students, or more likely their parents, can put Commodore cash to use that cash on their Commodore card to pay for Uber rides. And one of the things we get in exchange for that, which is actually very valuable, is data. And these red areas on the campus are areas of intense pickup, drop-off activity. And that's really important in the context of land use because as we imagine partnerships uh, with Lyft and potentially other rideshare programs to assuage the need for parking on campus, this is very informative in terms of where would some ideal spots be for staging these. So you're not just replacing single occupancy vehicles with a new form um, of traffic. Uh, we were brave enough, the Chancellor and I, to actually hold not one but two university-wide town halls on these transportation opportunities here. And we hosted a series of working groups at our Wondery um, last spring. Those are listed in the middle. We've had great partnership from our Vanderbilt student government and harnessing the energy of our faculty, our students, our community, our, the ex expertise of Metro. We've met with folks from TDOT. Really a broad-based approach here um, we have come up with a set of key recommendations that, have to, that are sort of overseen by this set of common themes here. Connectivity, the need for governance, accessibility, communication, and analysis. So where we are now is that we actually, for the campus, and in partnership and in close dialogue with colleagues across the city, um, and the regional community, we are ready to begin implementing a whole series of things across all of these different areas. Um, some of our work actually with the help of uh, Professor Phillip and others has led us to seek some federal funding to actually help um, fund some of these aspirations. And I think you will hear a lot more to come um, on Vanderbilt's plans uh, in the future around transportation. I think what's really important, um, just, to, just to conclude, is that Vanderbilt has the opportunity, and again, in my view, 
the responsibility to provide leadership um, on these kinds of topics by, will it, by being willing to experiment with things like first generation autonomous vehicles, to implement uh, maybe the first instance of a dockless bike sharing program, to improve its infrastructure, and to work um, to help move forward a more a more integrated and higher quality of life, not just here on campus, but in the, uh, in the region more broadly. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, and thank you so much for letting me be part of the presentation today. So as Craig mentioned, I work in the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce, and I have the pleasure of serving on the Civic Design Center's board. And both of these groups, along with Vanderbilt, are members of Transit for Nashville, which is a group of 125 businesses, nonprofits, educational institutions um, that are interested in bringing transit to Nashville and trying to solve some of our traffic problems. Um, I also spent over a decade at the planning department trying to guide growth so that it benefits Nashvilleians today and in the future. And we have definitely seen some growth. As we've discussed, Nashville's growing. Middle Tennessee region is expected to grow by about a million more people in the coming 25 years. With that comes congestion. If you've thought there seem to be more cars on the road, it's not just you. There's over 100,000 new people um, in the region, and we've gone from being a 15-minute city to being a 30, a 45, an hour um, long city. And what's interesting about this is Nashvilleans are now spending about 34 hours a year caught in traffic at the cost of over $1,400 per person and that's time away from our families. But also, it's important to know that commute time is the strongest factor in the um, escaping poverty. Um, the National Bureau of Economic Research has found that the longer the average commute, the worse the chances are of a low-income family moving up the economic ladder. Um, we know at this point from our experience and the experience of other cities that more roads will not solve the problem. Um, Professor Goetz spoke to induced demand. He called it the iron law. I have to say in the research that I've done working in city planning and transportation, I have not seen that applied to transit. Um, what you see is as a road gets widened, you see that it loosens up the traffic for a bit. And then all your friends figure out that that extra lane is there and everybody kind of piles on. But when um, part of the road, part of the right of way is given over to transit, we're moving people so much more efficiently in buses, in train cars, that that lane can just move so many more folks. And I think that's kind of at the key of all of this is that instead of looking at moving cars, which is generally how we think about traffic, we're moving toward thinking about how we move people. And that's one of the things that a transit investment can do for us, is we can start to look from storefront to storefront on our streets and think about how are we going to move people on sidewalks? How are we going to move people with transit? How are we going to move single occupancy vehicles? But it's about how we move people, not just how we move cars. Um, that's also why autonomous vehicles are coming, but I don't believe they're going to solve the problem. What we've seen with things like Uber and Lyft, the latest data out of San Francisco, out of New York City, is that they're actually adding to the congestion. What you think about it, you pull them up on your phone and you can see all the Uber and Lyft cars circling around. That's folks in a car adding to traffic congestion. At the end of the day, one person, one car won't solve the problem. We need more high capacity options. Now, we've been discussing how we want to grow for a long time, and that's been culminated now in the Let's Move Nashville Transit Plan, the plan that's before the voters on May 1st. The Civic Design Center is a group that's been working on this issue for nearly decades now. And the solutions that the Civic Design Center has considered are some of the same that are in um, Let's Move Nashville. 
before the city began engaging citizens and thinking about a 25-year vision, the Civic Design Center was getting our creative juices flowing with the plan of Nashville. Some of you may participated in this. It was envisioning back in 2002 to 2005 how to create a vibrant downtown and surrounding neighborhoods. It culminated in 10 principles for how to link um, land use and the built environment to help our community. And here are two of the more critical ones, that we need to develop a convenient and efficient transportation infrastructure. And one of my favorites, we gotta reestablish the streets as a public space for connectivity, but also for community. Now some of the strategies that came out of um, this plan of Nashville uh, culminated in moving Tennessee forward, which was a document by the Civic Design Center, a toolkit. How can we design our streets, our sidewalks, um, open spaces and buildings so that um, in suburban areas all the way to urban areas, we can have an emphasis on walkability and how we move people and create community. The key component that I want to focus on is called Healing the Pikes. It's a chapter in Moving Tennessee Forward. And I think the name is just kind of perfect. Because if we think about our pikes right now, they aren't really working for us very well. They're not very safe. Um, our a number of pedestrian injuries and mortality in Nashville is just devastatingly high. Um, they're not convenient for folks who want to walk, who need to walk, um, and they aren't really moving people very well. We're just sitting in traffic, as I discussed earlier. Um, with this focus on the pikes, it's important that the Civic Design Center has always seen pikes not just as a way to get through town and out to the region, but as a destination in among themselves. This is where people live, where they want to have amenities, where they work. And so the Civic Design Center, through Healing the Pikes, looked at pikes like Nolensville Pike. Um, this upper picture is just north of Walmart, where Nolensville has the intersection with Harding. And it's an incredibly wide street. And then hidden there kind of in that tree is a bus uh, stop. But you'll notice there's no safe crossing across Nolensville to get to this bus stop for several hundred feet to the south or to the north, and there have been multiple pedestrian and car accidents along this stretch. Now in the lower picture is a reimagining how with transit investment and private sector investment, we can heal this pike. Features like a tree-lined median that can provide a safe space for someone crossing the street, a dedicated transit lane so we can move people more efficiently, um, pedestrian connections that are well lit, well designed, um, outdoor seating and place-making features. Meanwhile, here's a closer to Vanderbilt, a reimagining of the intersection at 21st Avenue South and Broadway. Um, this is where the new development um, that Eric mentioned is. Um, and it, before that development, gave an example of how um, we could take back part of that street to calm the traffic. So many students and faculty and staff having to go through this in, in, um, intersection on foot. How we can calm the traffic, still move people efficiently, and really create a sense of place. So the Civic Design Center has been talking about this intersection of transit and land use and design of the built environment for a long time. The planning department followed this research with Nashville Next. It was a three-year process um, with over 18,000 inputs from Middle Tennessee and to create a vision for growth and preservation for the next 25 years. Now the main takeaway was that um, folks wanted to focus growth in downtown, midtown, and along prominent corridors, and they wanted to support that with transit. After Nashville Next, the Metro Transit Authority and the Regional Transportation Authority worked together to look at our entire region to think about transit for the next 25 years. We had more than 20,000 Middle Tennesseans who weighed in, um, and overwhelmingly, they confirmed they wanted to uh, focus development in our downtowns of our communities and along prominent corridors, and they wanted to go big and bold on transit, including light rail and commuter rail. So that brings us to Let's Move Nashville. You can kind of think of this as taking that regional in motion plan and then finding the first steps for Davidson County to lead on this. 
It lays out investments to be made in Davidson County to move our residents around the county, but also it'll have a ripple effect out into the region as we um, loosen up congestion in Davidson County for people coming in from the outlying counties. And it also sets the stage for the outlying counties, if and when they're ready, to extend transit into their region. Now throughout all the plans, there's a real theme here in remembering that um, movement occurs on a hyper-local level and on a regional level. I want to be able to move comfortably, safely, conveniently around my neighborhood, but then also we got to move a lot of people around the region. Um, and this is probably a good moment to talk about ridership. Um, you know, everybody can look at different cities on ridership. I have just recently come back from Seattle, where with their infrastructure investments in bus, in light rail, in a downtown tunnel, they have added 60,000 jobs to downtown. And meanwhile, they've seen their single occupancy vehicle ridership decline by 29%. And it's because they gave other options. In Minneapolis, when they launched their blue line, um, their peak period traffic volume went down while regional traffic was going up. People are interested in reclaiming their time and having part of their lives back. In Nashville, from 2000 to 2017, the ridership was up 23%. We've seen a decline slightly in the last two years, and I think it's really telling to see which lines actually still are increasing. It's the lines where we make the transit really reliable. It's the bus rapid transit lines and it's Music City Star, which says to me, if we make an investment in that higher order transit that's dependable, people will come to it. We see it in other cities and I think we'll see it in Nashville too because those are the lines in Nashville that get the best ridership and increases in ridership. Um, the thing I like about Na uh, Let's Move Nashville is it starts at the pedestrian level. It has money dedicated for funding sidewalks, intersection improvements, and improved transit stops to make it safe and convenient and comfortable to get around. Um, it also funds 19 neighborhood transit centers to provide safe and convenient access um, to the entire system. These are spots where you can wait for the train or bus without getting wet. You can buy your ticket ahead of time to make it a lot quicker. Um, a lot of these will have a park and ride, um, which I think that's where we'll pick up a lot of outlying county folks using it as well, and folks in the outer parts of Davidson County. They'll have B-cycle stations, Lyft and Uber drop off. The next layer is the buses, and um, this part of the Let's Move Nashville plan, I don't think it's gotten as much attention. Um, and it's really the workhorse of the system, and it's the reason that the system can reach so many more Nashvillians and give us all more access. Um, on this map, I really want folks to notice the density of the lines. And think about, this is all within Davidson County. Um, consider the number of neighborhoods and commercial centers, employment centers, educational institutions, and amenities that are touched. With the bus lines, what we're seeing is funding to have the buses come more often every 15 minutes. Um, we'll see crosstown routes. What a lifesaver. Imagine if you live in Antioch and you work at Vanderbilt's um, place at 100 Oaks. Right now, you're taking that bus all the way into downtown and then taking another bus out to 100 Oaks. With the crosstown routes, you'll be able to go up, across, and you're at work and um, cut so much time off your travel. Um, I talked about the transit centers and the sidewalks and intersections, and then also there's funding in here to move to longer hours from 5.15 in the morning to 1.15 at night. And the best part is, these are some of the early deliverables. If Let's Move Nashville um, passes on May 1st, the city can begin to uh, collect revenues on July 1st, and we could see some of these improvements in 2018 and 2019. We could be giving more people more access within the year. 
In addition to the improved backbone of bus service, um, there are four rapid bus routes. I do have to politely take issue with how those were described. The bus routes, the rapid bus, it's actually a menu of items that will be discussed per route. And so there might be dedicated lanes in some situations if there's space, but there's also queue jumps to get around tough intersections. There's having the bus talk to the light, say, hey, coming through, hold the light for me. So those will actually be um, uh, determined by the bus route based on what kind of context and, and um, opportunities they are, are. But those are out on Dickerson Pike, uh, 21st Avenue South, West End, and then up Rosa Parks and out Clarksville Highway to serve to serve Bordeaux. Um, there's also the light rail that's proposed for Gallatin Pike out to Briley, for Murfreesboro Pike to the airport, for Nolansville Pike out to Harding, uh, Charlotte Park, Pike out to um, Whitebridge, and then one that I am particularly um, excited about, it's the line that goes up to North Nashville. It all actually is a spur off of Charlotte, and it's using existing rail lines that go through North Nashville to serve Meharry, Fisk, TSU and Jefferson Street. Part of the reason I'm excited about this is um, to serve North Nashville. They have such narrow historic streets with a lot of fabric that we don't want to necessarily disrupt. So using this existing line allows us to serve the community without disrupting um, Jefferson Street. Serve Jefferson Street without destroying it. So pretty excited about that. And then there's the um, short um, 1.8 mile downtown tunnel. I want to talk about that in a minute. I did want to point out um, there are no express lanes on here. I know that that's an option that Professor Getz mentioned. The, those are basically a, a toll road um, to make clear and the research shows that these do not help traffic because at the end of the day there's enough people willing to pay the money that they end up getting clogged up as well. They serve the same kind of traffic. Um, and also, I, I, I am a little troubled by the fact that a, a toll road ensures that people with means can move around versus everybody being able to move around. But at the end of the day, the punchline is toll roads are all but illegal in Tennessee. The state has set up a law that says that you can do a pilot of those, and TDOT's made pretty clear that they're not interested in having toll roads. Okay, the tunnel. Let's spend a moment on the tunnel. The tunnel, not just a shiny object. Instead, I want to make the argument that it's really key to the entire system. Um, and I use this by doing an example. Let's say that you live up in Madison, but you work down at the airport. So you park at the park and ride, and you hop on the light rail. So you take that down, it gets you downtown, but then let's say there's no tunnel. Okay, well then you're going to hop on our same narrow historic streets downtown and crawl along through traffic and then get back in your dedicated lanes on the way down to the airport. Oh, and by the way, since we use our streets downtown to party, we'll close the streets every once in a while and you won't be able to make it through downtown. And so I, I want to make the argument that actually building the tunnel is building um, new capacity an ability to move people dependably through downtown to their final destination. Um, and it allows us to continue to use our roads how we want to. Um, and that dependability on the transit, it's critical. That's how we get people um, interested in making the change. Okay, so how are we going to pay for it? Um, on May 1st, we're talking about um, revenues that we would be raising to pay for transit. And there's four types of taxes. They're listed here, and the sources give us a revenue base that's uh, shared by businesses, by employees, by tourists, um, by visitors. The Chamber's research has found that in the sales tax, 47% of Davidson County's sales tax um, comes from out-of-county people. So I have not broken this yet to my mother-in-law who lives in Brentwood that every dollar I am putting in in sales tax for my transit, she is putting in a dollar as well when she comes to uh, visit us and go to the zoo. Um, what does that mean in terms of the average person's pocketbook? Um, we're looking at, for the first five years of the plan, on the sales tax, the impact is about $5 per month. And for the latter five, um, after the first five years, when it goes up to one cent of sales tax, it's $10 a month. Um, but what does the funding cover? 
Um, the, much has been made about the $5.4 billion and the 8.9. Let me clarify that. The 5.4 is construction. That's how every government everywhere talks about this kind of investment. What's the present day value of construction? But what Metro has done that I think is pretty intriguing is the funding sources I listed, that pays for the whole kit and caboodle. It pays for construction, for operations, for maintenance, for a contingency fund in case there are cost overruns. It pays off the debt. And they built in funding so that folks at 100% or 100% or of the people at or below the poverty level ride for free. And I think that's pretty critical too because at the end of the day, express lanes, Uber Lyft, the idea of paying for the road you're using, that works if we all have means and we don't. And so when we talk about what does this transit do if I'm not using it, it makes our city available to everyone. It gives us all more economic opportunity and that's what we need to make a city like Nashville run. Here's a little bit on the benefits. Um, we're talking about, um, when Eric was talking about where his staff lives, at full build out, we'll have 76% of Davidson County residents and 89% of our jobs within a half mile of transit. You see the economic impact, there's the jobs. I need to also get a slide about how this is a big opportunity for us to provide affordable housing. We've got the transit oriented development. The very first one is coming out of the gate in Donaldson of the increment in taxes, they've dedicated a third of that for affordable housing. I think about the units, that family that we can cut down their housing costs and get rid of their transit costs, that's huge. All right, uh, comes down to May 1st. We've had plenty of time to plan, but we've never had an opportunity to actually put money to it, and this is our chance. Um, ten years from now, I do not want to have my kids and others saying, why didn't you guys take care of this? It's uh, May 1st. So there's an opportunity to register to vote by April 2nd. There's early voting. Please talk to your friends and family. And if you're interested in learning more, um, you can visit us at transitfornashville.com. Thanks. Thank you all. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to prevail. Those of you that would like to stay for a few minutes, I'm going to prevail on my panel to uh, to uh, stick around for a couple of minutes, and we'll we'll take a few questions. Uh, I'll also let you know that uh, we have a fourth uh, forum scheduled for April 17th. Uh, we haven't quite uh, quite zeroed in on what the format of that uh, that will be, but. Uh, um, we will, we, I'm sure we will be uh, incented to leave more time for questions than we have in these first three. So, questions please. Um, the reason I ran up first is uh, I had to run to class. Um, <laughs> but uh, Professor Getz, uh, I would direct this, I guess, primarily at you and I'd like to hear everyone else's perspective as well. Um, uh, thank you for your economics perspective uh, because, you know, this is a very large investment and it shouldn't be taken lightly. But I'd like to hear sort of, I guess, a, an, an economist's perspective on the human fact, on the monetary value of human factors considerations. Um, students being able to move around Nashville, uh, the low income people being able to move around Nashville, uh, as well as things like um, the emissions and public health uh, risks that come from single occupancy vehicles and uh, you know, less efficient modes of transportation. So the General Motors, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles are all electric. Uh, France and Germany have announced that they will only allow new cars that are all electric to be sold after 2030. China is supposed to make the same decision. And any, all of the car manufacturers on the planet want to participate in those countries. And so the United States, uh, General Motors and the other companies are all moving rapidly toward an all electric future for the automobile. Uh, and the uh, cost of photovoltaic generation electricity is falling very rapidly, so on the generation electricity side, we should be moving to a very low carbon footprint pretty rapidly. Uh, and I've described the autonomous cars and the pooling, so these aren't necessarily single occupancy vehicles. Uh, and my colleague gave an example of going from Madison to the airport. That's a 21 minute ride, train ride from the um, Riley Parkway to downtown, and it's a 26 minute train ride from Fifth and Lafayette out to the airport, 
That uh, comes to 47 minutes, and there's going to be additional time for layover for what is about a 12-minute uh, ride from Madison to the airport on Briley Parkway. So it's a shorter trip. Point-to-point -point trips are more efficient, uh, they're faster, and they have a very positive uh, human factor, I think, for all of us. Um, I kind of take the view, I appreciate the question. Um, I like to think about the triple bottom line, which a lot of people talk about. What are the social, economic, and environmental impacts of the decisions that you make? And I think looking at this just in terms of dollars and cents is a, kind of a myopic framework. I mean, some of our motivations here uh, on the Vanderbilt campus are to have an impact on our, our carbon footprint. And we do want to embrace the kinds of new technologies and approaches uh, that are necessary. Um, also, I think, you know, something I failed to mention earlier, but I'll bring it up now in terms of the affordable housing. I think the single best way to reduce traffic is to have people living closer to their places of work and in neighborhoods that have the amenities that they want and they need to, um, you know, lead a productive and enjoyable life. That's why Vanderbilt is very interested in developing some of the land it's acquired over the years at 21st and um, Broadway to bring first our graduate students back closer. Graduate students like to live near campus. They're often here uh, throughout all hours of the day and we think that's a real opportunity to not only bring them closer and help mitigate some of the traffic and congestion they no doubt contribute to, but to have truly, uh, you know, kind of a 21st century development prime, you know, based on uh, principles of sustainability and when we get into those kinds of dialogues we extend them further to even like well what about our faculty and staff they uh, they have the same kinds of pressures and even increasingly in some of those discussions we hear from um, Ameriti members of the faculty or retirees and they say what about us we'd like to live you know kind of kind of near the, uh, the campus but I think you have to take a full equation perspective I also think that if you um, one of the advantages I see about, you know, put the time aside about the public transportation opportunity is that when people are driving uh, in a car through all that congestion, I mean, your blood pressure just goes up and up and up and it's getting worse and worse and worse and then you show up for work ready for a big day and you're, you know, you're kind of stressed out. So I think that um, from a health and wellness perspective, um, the use of public transportation as well can be a you know, positive thing. Those are just a few thoughts. I think the only one that I would add is that um, looking at uh, graduation rates in Davidson County at the college level and in surveys with graduates, what we're finding is that the second barrier to graduation is transportation. It's only behind childcare. And so um, speaking to what you were saying about students, that's the piece that I'll add is that we see it's a real issue for students at all of our academic institutions. I'll, I'll put a, uh, I want to put a quick plug in for, uh, for the Nashville Civic Design Center, which I've had the pleasure of serving on, serving on the board of for a number of years. And uh, their more, most recently completed study involved uh, uh, what I think is called healthy communities. And uh, maybe, it'll be, maybe it'll be part of what we'll incorporate into the fourth form. So thanks for the question. Uh, I don't think we have any other students, so uh, please. As a uh, homeowner in Nashville, uh, some of us think that $5.4 billion is expensive. Now, I wonder how many of the panel would support the plan if they were a homeowner in Nashville at $5.4 billion, and is there another cost that you might also support the plan? How high would you go? Yeah, I, I can respond to that. I'm a homeowner in East Nashville for the last 10 years, and I, I do support uh, the transit plan insofar as uh, the recommendations of the mayor's task force on housing and transit get implemented. Uh, if one looks on uh, Councilman Mendez's uh, blog, uh, we notice the Donaldson plan has not uh, followed through with any of our recommendations completely, so we hope that as these transit-oriented development, these corridor plans get put in place, that we actually have number targets of how much affordable housing at different levels, that we actually, because uh, I would support uh, my tax dollars going to make sure that my fellow citizens in the city who are not as fortunate as I am in terms of salary or, or wage, 
have a place to live and don't have to sit in uh, traffic for a long time because they can't afford to pay 13 or 20 bucks to go in a lane during peak rush hour time if it's for charge, uh, where people do have an option to go for free if they're truly under the poverty line. Uh, but also, I want to see them be able to live somewhere near where they work, because our hospitality industry is downtown. And so I'm all for making transit a priority, but I want to see the housing part and the work that we did on the mayor's task force fall through so we really get the true benefit. And yes, I'll pay higher taxes for that. Would you support the plan at six billion or eight billion? Yes. Or ten billion? I would support the plan because it's not just about money. The uh, I have the luxury. My father was a transportation planner, and in 1970s they did a assessment of would uh, MARTA for Atlanta work? Was it worth it? And th back in those days, that's when you did ridership studies. That's when you really did just kind of the you know cost benefit analysis based upon money. But as some of the other speakers have talked about, there are these other benefits that are, are very much experienced by people when you have all the different transportation options open. So you don't have to walk down uh, Charlotte all the way down by the mall on the way West End and you don't have a sidewalk and you can get hit where you actually have transit to get you uh, from work to childcare to home in a way where uh, single parents aren't burdened as much because we know uh, that that's something. And our public housing residents and low-income residents, the uh, barriers to employment are transportation and child care and health. But transportation and child care are the top two. So yes, I would support that for the betterment of our community. Um. Austin voted, Austin, Texas voted down a referendum to support uh, rail transit. They've moved to emphasize higher quality bus service, and I believe they're doing very well. So I think the answer to your question is that a bus intensive approach can serve more people better at significantly less money. Um, I live in Nashville, Davidson County. I'm a homeowner, and I am willing to spend $5 or more in sales tax a month now, and in five years, $10 more. The, the thing I did want to mention is it's so easy to forget that there is also a cost to doing nothing. Um, the, we, we, we know the story, those of us that have been in and working in Metro for a while, Mayor Purcell had the opportunity to do some transit and at that time uh, the feds were offering a 80% match. Um, Bredesen had an opportunity, no pardon me, Dean had the opportunity, it was at 40% match. Now this plan is very conservatively talking about 20% match. We are needing to rely on ourselves and we're needing to realize that we're paying for traffic every day in lost time and lost money. And my life allows me to bear that in a different way than some of my neighbors with less means. And that's why I am willing to do this. Recognizing that there are alternative uses, would you still pay six billion or eight billion or twelve billion? Absolutely. Is there any limit? I think that at the end of the day, what we're looking at is five dollars a month per person. Meanwhile, um, to pay for transit uh, is is fifty five dollars for the pass. And so, for folks who are of lesser means to not have to pay for that, I just I think about how this offers opportunities for all of us here today, I, I, I think that we have to take action. The cost is only going up to all of us and to the city. I'm going to try to, we have two more questioners and uh, we'll, we'll take brief questions, please. And I want to thank you all for this uh, exciting uh, discussion we had with very polar views and I think that's a good point for a discussion. Uh, I grew up with public transportation uh, in Europe, as you might tell, uh, and I was very excited about the public tra uh, transportation initiative here. I do see, though, very significant shortfalls here. Uh, one of them being like a lot of these lines end somewhere in the middle of the county, like Whitebridge. What sense to make a line to Whitebridge when most everybody comes from Bellevue? on this path. Makes not much sense to me. Why, why did that happen? The other shortfall is 
we just heard that Vanderbilt is one of the bigger employers here in the city. There is no connection except for some buses. But to get on the bus, for most of the light rails you have to transfer. So that adds time. And then we don't even know necessarily whether we have dedicated lines, which in most of the places where buses really work well, we have dedicated lines. So I'm not quite sure how that plan came together and okay. how Thank we you. would overcome these. Would anybody like to comment on that? Jennifer? The plan came Thank together you. through the steps of planning that I described. Right. And you saw that in motion there is a much larger regional plan that takes these lines out further. But it doesn't in, even go to the uh, county uh, line. Uh, right, Sorry. in the regional plan. Now right. what Let's Move Nashville is, is the first step. It's right. the first investment. And with any investment, you have to balance where am I putting money with what is the cost benefit of who's going to use it, where is the density. Um, one thing I will say is May 1st presents us the opportunity to finally take any plan and attach money to it to take action. I, I heard one of my colleagues say, hey, if you like to argue about transit, you should vote for transit on May 1. Because if we have the funding in the future, then we can debate, okay, do we want this line to extend? Would we rather have bus rapid transit versus light rail? How do we want to connect into the outlying counties? What are they going to pay? How are we going to work together? But if we don't take action on May 1, what happens is we continue to limp along, giving MTA a little bit more money each year to extend buses. So I hear what you are saying. But do about we have how any, hey, do we have any guarantees? I'm sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut it off and we got one okay. more, we're gonna take one more question and thank you. I tend to agree with this gentleman <laughs> for the most part, at least as far as it, it does seem to end around Davidson, and yeah, I get it's a left to move Nashville. And, um, but I, one of the things that I just wanted to bring up is um, a lot of the reason that a lot of people move outside of Davidson County isn't just because they can't afford a house in Davidson County. In fact, uh, many times if you look at, uh, say, Williamson County, for example, if I move to Davidson County, I can get the same house for $100,000 less um, than being in Williamson. And the main reason for that is the schools. And that's why people are moving to outside counties is the school and the education. And if you want to get a comparable education, you're actually going to be paying for a private school, which many people don't really want to do. They would rather see their child in public education system, but a good one. And so my concern there, and I concern that I've heard from a lot of people is, okay, well, yeah, let's move Nashville, it's great, but a lot of the people who are moving outside are doing so not just for affordability. And so those same people are going to be the ones that need to get home for their kid because their kid had to come home sick or something like that. So they have the reason why they need a car. And so to have better transportation to get people from those outside areas into the city I think is equally valuable and I think that's part of the reason why a lot of people are having trouble really buying into this and so I'm curious how the education system and how looking at that and other reasons why people have moved out has been factored into this whole plan. I know there are a myriad of reasons why anybody chooses where they're going to live, right? One of the things that we found during Nashville Next is that um, with the retiring of the baby boomers and the millennials waiting longer to establish households and have children, overall decline in how many children folks are having, um, that's why we're seeing some of this pressure in Davidson County. It's a, a very attractive place. if. Um, if you're wanting to just enter into the workforce, if you're retiring, you want to be closer to the action. I think speaking to the regional piece, the one part I want to put out there is the in motion plan was um, created with the Regional Transportation Authority and what's called the Mayor's Caucus, a group of all the mayors in the region. And every single one of them endorsed in motion 
I believe that shortly they're going to be endorsing Let's Move Nashville because they realize this is the first step. And I can tell you, the outlying county mayors are watching very closely to figure out when and how they will hook into this system so that we can have a truly regional system to address some of the issues that you're talking about, why people move to outlying counties and how they still want access to downtown Nashville and they want access throughout the region. Malcolm, and I don't think I gave you the chance to react to the pre previous question, so okay. I'm sorry for that. Um, uh, Seattle and Denver and Atlanta all started as multi-county jurisdictions for transit when they adopted the sales taxes and the tax system for it. It's very unlikely that additional suburban counties will join the venture here. <coughs> Williamson County just raised their sales tax for fund schools. We should be doing the same thing in Davidson County. It's, I share your view that improving our schools is really critical to the success of Davidson County. Secondly, because express lanes are a much less expensive way to provide high quality transit service to outlying counties, uh, with the uh, support of the state government, uh, those counties are much more likely to integrate uh, commuter bus service and express lanes which move at highway speeds uh, and make much better quality integrated uh, regional transportation system as I illustrate on the map with uh, the Atlanta region. Thank you all. Thank you. Real simple. Mine can be answered with yes or no. You've proposed that uh, students, low-income people can ride for free. How about senior citizens on fixed income? Have they been considered? Um, if they're in the poverty, below the poverty level, they'll get free. And I think I have heard conversations about scaling it. Um, and then a lot of senior citizens right now are using Access Ride, which there is funding in Let's Move Nashville to greatly expand the Access Ride system for seniors and disabled folks. So they have been considered. Yeah. Thank you. Columbus, Ohio is subsidizing Uber and Lyft access in low-income neighborhoods. A lot, a lot of good reasons to live in Hawaii, and one of them we know about is that seniors get to ride transit for free. So um, we'll take one more question, and then we're gonna then we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you. I, I think this one can be brief. Is the plan locked in to rail? I keep hearing we've still got more plans to do. We've got more studies to do. We've got more plans to do. What about buses that we can? I understand what you said, have on the road by the end of this year, if the vote passes, how many buses can we have on the road by the end of this year? How many routes will be expedited? So, I have to get out my piece of paper here. The, the routes are largely expanding and improving the existing routes we have mm -hmm. today by adding more buses. And I know we've got frequently. three that have expanded over the two years since right. we Barry and, got elected. And so there would be a 50% increase in the bus fleet and 41% increase in service hours. As to your prior... When? when? What uh, about? That's at by the, the end of this year. That's by 2023, I think. By I the end of this year, I'm afraid I do not know the number okay. on that. I can try to track that because, down for you. Because 2023, that's five years off. It is, but then on the other hand, we're also saying, why didn't these people start this five years ago well, yes, or ten years ago? Yes. Yeah. But, so. well, I mean, this, this was part of the ex-mayor's uh, campaign, we're going to have more buses because I'm looking at that. If we had good bus service, we would have better ridership. I'm concerned that we will commit all this to rail. There will not be riders because the buses. Well, and to that question, if you look at the ballot language, it lists that what you'd be purchasing is um, light rail and or rapid bus. And so it provides for flexibility. So do buses have priority? 
over rail? No, the light rail has priority thus far where it's listed because that's what came out of these years of planning and what was heard from the communities. Now, I think when we go out, when the city goes out and talks to each of these corridors, if and when this passes on May 1st, that's when they have the conversation. But that represents the input from lots of Nashvillians over many well, years. That's I'm, why it's in there. I had read the other ones and I didn't realize there was that much emphasis on rail over buses. Okay, thank you. Well, I want you to help, but please thank the uh, panelists with me and uh, hope to see you in April. <laughs>